Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Well, during these last, uh, during these three evenings of Evensong, uh, this fall, I'm presenting a, uh, 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 a series on the origins of Christian worship, drawing on a lecture given by Father Thomas Hopko in 2012 called From Shadow to Reality, Ancient Christian Worship, as well as some other sources. Last week, I shared the early theme of the eschatological, the end times, the coming kingdom, the fulfillment of the ages. Christianity has a future orientation, the now but not yet, a future realization and fulfillment that awaits us. This evening, I'm going to speak a little bit about the place of worship, the physical place, the objects. To review from last week, at its core, the church's worship is based on the scriptures, the law, the psalms, and the prophets of the Old Testament with a strong messianic theme. For the early Christian, the messianic age has been fulfilled in Jesus. The scriptures for the early Christian, what we would call the Old Testament, were just that a testament to a prefiguration of Christ. And worship was, continue, was con considered to be a continuation of the worship of Israel in this new age, this new creation. It would really be impossible to understand the way Christians worship, or indeed any of the New Testament texts, without understanding that it, it is all rooted in the Old Covenant the Old Testament, and is considered uh, the very fulfillment, the flowering of these roots. So let's now move into the idea of place in worship. Well, much like Christianity's, uh, Christianity itself following its Jewish lineage, lineage, the Hebrew rites and forms of worship also grew out of and drew on its own prehistory of agricultural deities and sacrifice systems. The first Yahweh feasts were agricultural and cosmic, such as the uh, uh, Tu Beshevat and Purim, followed by connecting feasts with the great acts of God in history, such as Hanukkah, which is the victory that God won uh, for the Maccabees over the Syrian army of Antiochus, uh, Epiphanes in 165 BC. And of course, the great Pascha, Pasach, the great Passover. We also hear in Exodus, for example, of the tabernacle as a place. Here God was understood to be present in a special, mysterious way to his people. And the tabernacle's construction is outlined in great detail in the scriptures as a kind of portable tent-like structure. And much like the old pagan systems, this was where thought was thought to dwell in a special way and was carried around as they wandered uh, as a nomadic people in the wilderness until the creation of Solomon's temple where rested finally the Ark of the Covenant and the tablets of Moses in Jerusalem in around 960 BC. This site, which current day Jerusalem, also had prehistoric sacred significance and was thought to be the very place where Abraham offered his son Isaac in sacrifice. This place, the temple, became the heart of Judaism, even when destroyed by the Babylonians and rebuilt. Judaism continued as a Levitical sacrificial system. Thank offerings, praise offerings, peace offerings, forgiveness offerings, purification offerings, atonement offerings, mercy offerings, reconciliation offerings, for example, were all offered. And Christians came to believe that all of these were filled in the one offering, Christ's one oblation and sacrifice on the cross, the Paschal Lamb for the whole world. 
for the, these Christians, the destruction of the temple is part of the fulfillment of the messianic prophecy. The new age is realized for Christians. The baptized are called to share now in the sacrificial meal of the Eucharist, where Christians continue to receive his given body until he comes again. Let's take a moment to talk a little bit uh, as an example of the crucifixion according to John. Now, this in John, it happens on the day of the Passover. And if you can envision for a moment the temple of Jerusalem at Passover, thousands of pilgrims have come to the temple bringing or buying animals to sacrifice. The blood of an animal was thought to contain the life force, and a blood offering was for atonement with God for the forgiveness of sins. The annual pilgrimage to the temple at the Passover was to make one's annual atoning sacrifice. And in the Torah, the paschal sacrifice, the lamb was not to have any of its bones broken, a pure, unblemished offering. So you can just imagine the scene at the temple, thousands of pilgrims having animals slaughtered on the altars by priests. The blood would have needed to be constantly washed off the waters with buckets of water. There was a rough plumbing system that carried this commingled blood and water through the streets of the temple and out the wall. Now, note that the crucifixion, of course, happens just outside the wall, just outside the temple. So imagine the backdrop on Good Friday behind the cross during the Passover feast and the river of water and blood cascading down the temple wall from the temple plumbing. Here's the text of John just after Jesus has given up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled, none of his bones will be broken. So surely you can see the parallel. The spear in Jesus' side, this commingled blood and water, uh, just like the wall behind it, represents the blood of God, the life force of God, commingled with the water of creation, flowing out his side, like the temple. Jesus is now the Paschal Lamb, the Passover, with no broken bones. The scripture has been fulfilled. He has replaced the old temple, which at the writing of John, of course, had already been destroyed. With the temple destroyed, the new Jerusalem of the Christian is now nowhere on earth. It's the Jerusalem which is above, the new Jerusalem that's coming as the bride at the end, as we read in the book of Revelation, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. The new Jerusalem for the Christian, then, is the Jerusalem that is only realized, as we spoke last week, at the end times in the eschaton, in the fulfillment of the ages. The only temple left is the temple of the Holy Spirit, you and me. For some, such as 4th century Gregory of Nyssa, pilgrimage to any holy location is absurd because there cannot be any holy places. The earth is where Christ was crucified until we, and so we wait until his coming again. What is holy, however, is the Christian Christians make places holy because God lives in this people of God who participate in the kingdom that is to come, which is what we do on the eighth day every week. 
we call upon and create and taste the new creation at this heavenly banquet of the Eucharist. The Eucharistic Supper is not simply a memorial of what happened in the past. It's a memorial of what is happening now in the risen Christ and will come at the end of the ages. And so wherever the people of God are gathered to do just that, that is where holiness is. As we noted last week, Christ is worshipped everywhere in spirit and in truth. And we, the baptized, are his body on earth. So Christian worship takes place where the Christians are. The church, the body of Christ, is the living temple. And each individual member and the church as a whole, built on the apostles and the prophets, Christ the cornerstone. So the temple is where this community is the community of believers. And this community of believers has a form and a structure. Episcopate, bishops, deacons, presbyters, with the bishop at the center. And so to this day, uh, there's a license hanging outside the door of my office that I preside at the Eucharist on behalf of our bishop, the head of the body of, for the gathered community here. And that's why we have a bishop's chair at the back of every church. The chair isn't holy. In fact, if you go sit on it, it's rather uncomfortable. But it is a symbol of the head of the gathered body. A final note that in the earliest church, when Christianity was illegal, Christians testified with their life. That is what a martyr is. And Christians held these places with great esteem. And still living in that theme, that vestiges of the atonement for sin as blood, they would meet at the graves of martyrs. And they would celebrate the Eucharistic meal over their bones. To this day, including in many Anglican churches, the bones of a martyr or a saint are held in or underneath the altar. So the key to understanding place or objects in Christian worship is to remember that what is holy is humanity. We make things and places holy when we gather and we wait for his coming again. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this is one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus, as we heard from Paul. And as we prayed today in Eucharistic Prayer 1 of our Book of Alternative Services, which is drawn from the earliest of Eucharistic prayers, Send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts, that all who eat and drink at this table may be one body and one holy people, a living sacrifice in Jesus Christ our Lord, through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen.